Hello everyone, welcome back to Hot Seat. I'm Omi Moradas joining you from Tehran. And once again, I'm so grateful to be with you all from this educational platform and joining me. I have to say, I have a very, very uh, good opportunity to call all these amazing people my friends from this platform. And today, a very special guest, Stavros Perkopoulos is here with me from Athens, Greece. Hello, Stavros, and welcome to Hot Seat. Hello, Omid. How are you? Thank you so much, my friend, and thank you for accepting the invitation. Actually, it's my honor. And for all our audience, as you all know, over the past season and over the past sessions that we have almost 43, 44 sessions till now, we try to cover almost all aspects in infantology, periodontics, and prosthodontics. And one of the most challenging areas that usually in infant dentistry we are facing is the aesthetic zone. And the challenges is not only from the surgical standpoint, but also from the prosthetic, because at the end of the day, the patient sees the final results. And maybe we do so many procedures and put so many time and effort for the patient, but the final outcome is the key and the thing that the patient will see and they accept or not. So today we have a very, very interesting topic to talk about, especially this aspect, which is the implant in the aesthetic zone, current development, and who can be better than Stafford to cover this uh, topic for us, because as I will have in his CV, he's uh, among those practitioners that is an expert in both field of surgery, surgical aspects, and prosthetics. So it's a very good combination from the lecturer point of view and from the topic point of view. So before we start, I would like to have Stavros CV for all of you. I think so many of practitioners in the field of implant dentistry know this guy and his magic and his masterpieces. But as a tradition, I will have his CV for all of you. Dr. Stavros Pelikanos received his undergraduate degree in dentistry in 1991 from the National and Kapodosterian University of Athens, Greece. In 1993, he obtained his doctoral degree in prosthodontics from the University of Freiburg, Germany. And following his professional training, he established a private practice in Athens, oriented towards prosthodontics, implantology, and aesthetic dentistry. In 2002, he was appointed full-time lecturer at the Department of Prosthodontics, Dental School, University of Athens, and is now assistant professor in the same department. Since 2013, Dr. Pelikanos is an active member of European Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry. His professional affiliations include also the International College of Prosthodontics, European Prosthodontic Association, and Greek Prosthodontic Association. He's a faculty member of Guide Institute, which is, stands for Global Institute of Dental Education in Los Angeles, California. In 2008-11, he received second and first prize at the Scientific Award Competition of the European Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry, held in Madrid, Spain, and Istanbul, Turkey, respectively. To date, he has published over 20 articles and lecture nationally and internationally once again, it's my huge honor. Welcome to my friend. And the platform is all yours. And we're really looking forward to a beautiful presentation and a great discussion at the end. Thank you very much, Omid, uh, for uh, the introduction. One small correction that uh, I am not uh, <clears throat> um, anymore at the university. So practically, I left university since uh, four years now. Uh -huh. So everything else was true <laughs> and uh, I, it's really my honor when I see how many people were in your platform, all these uh, 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 
all this time, the last months, I am really amazed by, by the quality of the, of the persons, of the dentists that you, some of them are my mentors. And it's really, really amazing to see. Uh, uh, and I'm really honored to be in your platform. So basically, I start now. I'm going to share my screen and let me know if uh, <clears throat> if you have my screen now. It's perfect. Is it okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, perfect. Perfect. So uh, <clears throat> actually, implants in the aesthetic zone is, is something that uh, we are, uh, <laughs> I mean, we still try to find uh, the, the, the magic way to establish this, to do this. And uh, I would say uh, <clears throat> I have been uh, <clears throat> trying to be successful uh, all of these, uh, uh, the last 20, 25 years where I'm placing implants and it's, uh, I did a lot of mistakes uh, and it's really for me, a challenging situation whenever I have to do with implants in the aesthetic zone. So basically going from left to right, uh, you can see that um, how, is, how I started, <clears throat> uh, how we started uh, with um, uh, flat to flat connections, uh, knowing that uh, the bone after the first year will, uh, uh, will be reduced about one millimeter going to the um, to, to, to the first thread, uh, going to the right side where we are now, where we are trying to have bone over the implant shoulder, uh, trying to have, uh, uh, to use different connections, going from flat connections to uh, conical connections, uh, to, to um, platform sh uh, switching connections, and uh, uh, yeah, stuff like uh, that. So, uh, the question is, what are the clinical factors affecting the long-term final outcome? How can we achieve uh, uh, clinical outcomes, bone and soft tissue to be stable uh, over uh, time? And uh, uh, if you let me omit to talk all, for all about these factors, we need not one hour, but we will need like uh, a week to analyze all these factors. You see, it depends on so many things like uh, implant design, surgical protocol, implant positioning, bone phenotype, soft tissue phenotype. Um, in, when we're talking immediate or heel size, soft tissue thickness, uh, not only horizontally, but also vertically, abutments, and all of this stuff. We need a week to, to talk of for, for, for all these uh, uh, critical, I would say, factors. Uh, but I will focus on some of them which uh, I consider to, uh, I, I think, uh, are more important. And first of all, I would, start, I would like to start with a, with a case. Uh, what did we learn from the past? And this is a case where we did uh, <clears throat> almost eight, nine years ago, uh, central incisor number 11 with a vertical fracture. I go very fast because this is not the, the topic of the day, but for me, it's very important. Vertical root fracture number 11, we did, uh, we wait, we extracted the tooth, we waited for one month post extraction, then we did uh, implant macement, GBR procedure, connective tissue graft after the six months post-operative situation, as you can see here. And at the end, we had a final result which, uh, uh, looks good, I would say, with one implant, one crown to the lateral and uh, one uh, veneer to number uh, 20, uh, to number 21. So everything looked good, good, but I would like to share with you uh, one situation that we are facing uh, more and more and we see more and more and here you see the situation eight years after. So although I'm gonna speak about implants, uh, this is for me a nightmare in the aesthetic zone. Because as you can see, uh, uh, number 21 is erupted, implant stays in place, and although the soft tissue 
and the bone around the implant looks great, but this is for me a nightmare. And I see it more and more in my cases. So tooth growth is, is strong. I mean, uh, <coughs> this is a nice article from the Kiliaridis group. Uh, and uh, in the upper incisor area, we see this more and more. And uh, <coughs> uh, especially in uh, uh, adults, and in female adults, the continuous eruptions of the adjacent teeth is a fact. And um, <clears throat> another article, more recent, 2019, and uh, infraocclusion is present. You see the numbers, it's amazing. It's uh, almost 70 to 80 percent uh, among females. So it's uh, really, uh, we have to be cautioned. Whenever I cannot, uh, I don't, whenever I can uh, not to place an implant, I don't place implants in this. Zone. But unfortunately, uh, there are situations where we really have to place implants. So what are the current trends? What is more important, actually, uh, bone or soft tissue? You have, uh, you have had in your uh, previous speakers uh, talking about bone, the importance of bone, the importance of soft tissue. Uh, but uh, what is actually more important, bone or soft tissue? I would say we have to go first to the biologic width. We know that uh, around teeth, the biologic width uh, is uh, approximately two millimeters. <coughs> and when we are going around implants, we see that the numbers are slightly bigger. You see uh, <coughs> between three and four millimeter, which means that this is a factor that we have to take in, in consideration. How are the soft tissue developing around implants? What is the part of the... Uh, uh, connective tissue and the, the, the uh, junctional epithelium uh, <coughs> around implants. And uh, we see that these numbers are slightly bigger. We have some human biopsies. One is here from Tomasi uh, after eight weeks, showing that uh, <coughs> the dimensions of the biologic width is approximately 3.5 to 4 millimeter, divided in uh, half of it epithelium and half of it connective tissue. So. These are things that we have to, to, to know before we go into details, before we go um, into uh, the area which is called transmucosal contour, the area which is uh, actually the most sensitive area uh, in the uh, whole uh, procedure. And how predictable is the bone stability and the establishment of the mucosal barrier around uh, implants? Is this uh, predictably? Do we have any tools that we can uh, really uh, help uh, this uh, barrier to be developed? Going into the literature, we see a lot of critical, <coughs> we see a lot of heterogeneity in the critical factors. So this is something that, uh, uh, we have to um, uh, admit, and there are different differences in the surgical protocol. There are differences in uh, regarding immediate or hilt sites, uh, differences in the bone quality and quantity. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, regarding implants, uh, we see uh, this is an article, a nice article from my friend Stefano Grazis showing uh, implant collar designs and I'm talking about in implant collars because this is what uh, mostly has changed in the implantology that uh, we see that uh, uh, <clears throat> we go from divert implants in uh, convergent and thin implants or more I would say convergent implants so the implant neck design is a very important and critical factor of course the implant connection the roughness of the collar and uh, last but not least, the implant positioning in relation to the bone. So basically, I would say we are going from paper designs, which were considered to be modern, uh, into hybrid uh, designs. Implants, they have a more uh, narrow neck and uh, they are uh, uh, conical at the uh, optical part. So actually, it's uh, something like a combination of both uh, worlds. So um, we have seen and what we actually 
uh, see is that uh, the compression of the bone uh, around the neck of the implant, especially in the aesthetic zone, is, uh, plays a big role uh, in the stability of the bone around the implant uh, neck. Uh, also, aesthetically, we are trying to um, especially, uh, we are trying to get uh, more stability in the apical part, and uh, we would like to have some space for the soft tissue and the bone in the coronal part. So I would say uh, <clears throat> modern hybrid implant designs are a new trend now in implantology. And I saw also to the last presentation, and I totally agree with uh, Stephen Chu, uh, which uh, he uh, presented more or less the same uh, concept. So when we are going about to the to the to the uh, abutment, uh, we are now. I would say platform switching is very important in the aesthetic zone, basically, and because uh, of the um, uh, the narrow spaces that we have. So we are going to less and less uh, uh, smaller implant diameter in the aesthetic zone, plus smaller abutments uh, with platform switching. So, and also the abutment design, the shape, the height, the roughness of the abutment is something that is really very critical. And um, some years ago, uh, we uh, wrote, I wrote a chapter in the book of uh, Dwayne Caratu, um, <clears throat> published in Springer, which, uh, where I, uh, uh, with details, I refer to these uh, kind of parameters. Uh, last but not least, uh, soft tissue. Soft tissue biotype, we knew and it's very important and um, uh, also last years we know all uh, we all know the studies of uh, Thomas Linkiewicz uh, who is uh, highlighting the importance of the soft tissue thickness not only horizontally but uh, also uh, vertic vertically and uh, this is something that uh, I uh, totally agree. Uh, as you may know uh, I am one of the <coughs> uh, um, I would say uh, clinicians that use the one abutment one time concept since uh, 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 a lot of years now, more than 10 years. So, uh, and uh, I think that uh, this is a protocol that uh, we can really use um, when we are talking about implants in the uh, aesthetic zone. So we know that uh, 23 years ago, there was a guy, a very famous guy, Abramson, uh, who published an article in the International in, uh, Journal of Clinical Periodontology, 97, uh, who was the first guy who, uh, who uh, uh, claimed that repeated uh, placement and removal of abutments could lead to bone desorption and optical soft tissue uh, displacement. So actually, since then, many clinicians, uh, you see Becker, Rodriguez, Alves, mainly in animal studies uh, confirmed uh, what Abramson said. And uh, now we have a lot of human studies starting uh, with uh, Italians, Canulo, the GD, uh, and then uh, Romanos and uh, Kutuzis, the Greek guys, uh, <clears throat> trying to find out what is the importance of the one time abutment. This is one of the uh, uh, RCTs, uh, the multi center randomized control trial uh, from Bresan, uh, showing that. Uh, he had in the group with uh, four disconnections, 0 0.4 uh, millimeter of bone loss. Um, uh, one and other systematic review from Kutuzis uh, showing uh, uh, same result in meta-analysis. So uh, the question is, some people say, okay, maybe this is not uh, so uh, clinically relevant, but uh, I would say, it is a puzzle. There are so many factors and uh, maybe each one of them clinically is not relevant, but uh, when we add them at the end of, of the story, at the end of, uh, of the work, uh, all of them play a role in the establishment of, uh, uh, of stable soft tissue and bone around uh, implants. So uh, I don't want to show other studies. So how can you, we use the one abutment, one time concept? And this is some, something that we started uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, 
trying to protect the bone loss, the bone remodeling, and the soft tissue uh, stability. So the first thing that we did many years ago is uh, we uh, um, prepared the abutment one time, so the final abutment, and uh, we did a small linear incision at stage two. So practically we covered our implants, we did uh, GBR, connected to graft and uh, cover our implants, and then at stage two, we connected the one time, usually zirconia made uh, uh, abutment. So, and this is something that we already published in the National Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry, uh, 2013, to, 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 uh, together with Sasa Jovanovic, Egon Oyue, and uh, Thanos Dunis. Then we started, we saw that uh, making full through the abutment one, one time might be tricky, not so easy, not something that you can do on Monday morning. So we, uh, uh, we did, uh, uh, we also tried it in, uh, in cases where we did immediate um, implant placement, like this one. You see the central incisor is uh, um, uh, fractured. Basically, this is a zirconia post, which we, of course, it's very difficult to remove. You see how thin is the buccal bone, and uh, this is one of the first cases that we did uh, the socket shell technique, uh, which I learned from my mentor, Marcus uh, Hurteler. Uh, we, uh, we, did, we fabricated the abutment and the provisional. Uh, we asked from the company uh, um, uh, Simplant in Belgium to produce a stereolithographic model with the implant inside as we planned and uh, in that model we uh, fabricated the one-time abatia and the provisional crown on top. So going to the surgery we did it atraumatically uh, as you can see here. Uh, I go a little bit faster, we remove the crown, you see the fractured root and uh, we uh, had the uh, guide stand, of course, the implant guide stand. You see the root, the socket shield technique, which we applied. This was one of the first socket shield that we did uh, eight, nine years ago. This is the implant guide, and the implant was placed through the stand, as you can see here. And we matched also the hexagon of the implant by aligning uh, the lines, as you can see here, removal of the stent implant. At that time, we did a socket shield in, 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 um, um, uh, uh, with uh, <clears throat> uh, not in distance, but uh, touching the implant and the final abutment. So as you can see here, this is three months post-op. We are uh, doing also the soft tissue. This is the radiographic with the provisional, the radiography with the provisional. This is six months post-op. And uh, we did a veneer to the neighboring tooth and a pickup impression on the one-time abutment. So practically, we didn't even place a cord for the, this uh, implant. And this is the final situation. Uh, a very nice work from Michalis Papastamos in Athens, Greece, with the zirconia abutment, flat to flat connection, as you can see here. And this is the um, uh, socket shield, uh, eight years in function, as you can see <coughs> uh, here. So, stable condition, one time abutment. But again, as you can see here, the neighboring central incisor is. Uh, uh, erupting, so we have this small discrepancy. Although the buccal part of the uh, contour of the soft tissue looks really uh, great. Uh, as I told you before, doing the one abutment one time full contour was a tricky situation. So we went to. Uh, I'm, I'm showing to you uh, cases from from the past. So I go step by step how did we develop this protocol. So we went to the one-time intermediate abutment. So uh, basically we did this first uh, with a flat-to-flat -flat connection uh, implant company. As uh, you can see here, the central incisor has to be extracted, implant placement, 
one-time intermediate abutment, GBR procedure, everything done uh, in one um, appointment. And uh, this is the uh, radiographically, radiographically the one-time abutment. So practically is like, uh, it is like a multi-unit abutment, but for single implants, which we, uh, not, we don't remove anymore. So this was a two-piece abutment, which of course we didn't uh, like, we changed this, but this was one of the first cases uh, uh, we, we have done before and after, this 1.5 years uh, later. And this is the radiographic evaluation. And this is six years later. You see how stable uh, <clears throat> looks uh, the central incisor. Uh, again, this was a two-piece intermediate abutment. We did a lot of cases and uh, uh, we did a six years follow-up and we published this protocol in the, in the International Journal of Periodontics and Historic Dentistry in 2017. So now what we uh, developed is that the one-time abutment, but in one piece. So this is something that we are following now. I'm uh, <clears throat> in all of my cases, uh, basically in the aesthetic zone, I am connecting a connect abutment, which is uh, 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 a difference between this older one is that uh, it's internal connection. It's more stable and gives you even more space for the uh, prosthetics and the soft tissue. Before going to analyze some cases, uh, for me, the timing is a very important issue. When we are talking about timing, we are talking about implant placement, we go immediate when we have the full buccal bony contour or uh, a small uh, uh, defect in the buccal bone around uh, two to three millimeters. Early, we go 1.5 or three months later after the immediate, um, um, after the extraction or late. So the bone, we, uh, the timing of the bone is before implant placement. And when we do before, when we place a bone substitute in the extraction socket before implant placement, we go always late. Uh, <clears throat> or we do it during implant placement. Connective tissue graft, a very important thing. We can do it before implant placement, during implant placement, or we can place connective tissue graft even after implant placement at the, at the second stage. And the timing of the abutment also very critical, immediate one time, at second stage one time, and we avoid to do it delayed where we have multiple disconnection. So what are the benefits of the one-time abutment? I'm gonna show you different applications in combination with uh, uh, soft tissue uh, grafting in some cases. This is a central incisor that has to be extracted. As you can see, we have a periapical lesion. So this is not a contraindication uh, in case we, uh, uh, we want to uh, place an implant. Uh, very... Uh, uh, we do it at the same time we are um, uh, connecting, we are uh, doing a connective tissue graft. So in, this, in this case, we place the implant. This is the uh, butterfly connective tissue. Basically, the, the, the part in the middle is with the epithelium. And uh, we have two parts like a butterfly, which is going to uh, go uh, buccally and uh, palatally. Uh, this is uh, something that I learned from Egon Oive uh, from Italy, a great clinician from, and friend from Italy. And uh, uh, also, so, uh, this is a, um, a modification from the Stimmelmeyer technique. So in this case, we place the implant. We didn't succeed to have uh, 30 newtons per centimeter to do the immediate loading procedure. Sometimes it happens. So what we do then is immediately connect the abutment one time, which we are the intermediate abutment one time, the connect abutment, which we are final torquing or if we can. And this is the way that we are placing the um, connective tissue graft over the connect abutment. So this is 
immediate implant placement, connect abutment, and connective tissue graft over the abutment. So the only thing that we have to do is wait. Wait for the maturation and the implant uh, osseointegration. So in this situation, what we do is that we are placing, you see the part with the epithelium remains over, and we are placing a Maryland bridge, and we are waiting. But everything is ready. We don't have to do nothing else than uh, just uncover the connected tissue graph. This is the initial situation. This is the Maryland bridge. And this is, uh, sorry, I'm going too fast. This is how it looks after we are uh, doing the second stage procedure and the uh, provisional. So we are doing the final work, not on the implant level, but on the abutment level. Another important issue is that we are always hand polishing the part of the uh, crown which is going into the soft tissue. So basically, we want to have it uh, hand polished and uh, high polished, and we don't have to. We don't like to have glazed part of the zirconia in the transmucosal part. So this is some something that we are always uh, using, we always do. And we are connecting, this is a final connection of the uh, implant crown on top of the connect. And this is how it looks. This is, uh, a beautiful work from um, uh, Nondas Lahopoulos, a very good dental technician, so technician that we have here in uh, Athens, and I'm very happy that I'm working with him. And this is the before and after. Practically, you see the implant on the right side for 1.52 millimeter, the connect abutment, then for 1.52 millimeter, the zirconia, and the layered ceramic goes only over the, con the soft tissue. Another situation uh, where we extracted number 12. So practically what we did here is extraction. Again, the combination of the uh, connective tissue graft with the three gingival graft, as you can see here, without implant placement. We are waiting for two months. This is uh, the way, this is a uh, uh, Stimmelmeyer technique, uh, which I like to use in case where I don't place the implant. And then 1.5, to two months later, we are coming and doing the GBR procedure, but the soft tissue is there. This is very important. So we have the soft tissue, now we are uh, dealing with the bone. Full thickness flap, guided implant surgery, something that we are doing in-house for me is very important that uh, although I have placed thousands of implants, I, I, I love to to go navigate it. I love to go navigate it because even small tenths of the millimeter can make a mistake. So final torque here, as you can see, and this is very important. On top, we are placing the implants now more or less 0 0.5 to 1 millimeter below the bone. So practically by placing the connect abutment, as you can see here, we are transforming a bone level implant into a tissue level implant. So this is the uh, concept that we are using. And in this situation, we do the GBR procedure, this horizontal GBR, uh, straightforward. I always like to pin the, uh, uh, most of the time, this is a, a resorbable membrane which I pin, I tack with two pins, and we do the horizontal GBR. And on top of the connect abutment, everything is closed. So practically, we are closing the connect abutment. One mattress suture and single interrupted uh, sutures. And this is the final outcome. Actually, first session was soft tissue, Second session was 
DBR procedure. A connect abutment place one time. You see the internal connection. and the final placement. And this is exactly, again, the same concept, implant placement, two millimeter of connect abutment and zirgonia um, on top of it. So practically, as I said, we are transforming a bone level implant into a tissue level implant. So how should be the ideal abutment uh, be? What is the ideal configuration for a single crown? And this is a case where we went for uh, layered uh, 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 ceramics. So practically the modern abutment configuration, if uh, you see uh, the, this line, if the, the lower line is the bone level, is to have for two millimeters titanium. And usually this titanium is the one time connect button. In case you are using a tight base, then this should be the height of your tight base. When we are placing the implants approximately two millimeter below the bone, below the clinical crown, so we are having another two millimeters. These two millimeters are cholesterolonia. So I totally agree here with the link with this concept, uh, with the polystyrgonia, and on top of it, we can place whatever we want. We can layer ceramics, we can place uh, name marks uh, or uh, whatever uh, we want. So basically the first meter, it's, uh, uh, we would like to have part of it maybe in the bone and part of it uh, uh, will be connective tissue integration. The last soft tissue, the last two millimeters will be epithelial attachment plus connective tissue, mostly epithelial attachment. So this is uh, the concept that we are uh, uh, using. Again, in a drawing, as you can see here, we are placing uh, the implant four millimeter below uh, the clinical crown in case that the implant is two millimeter uh, uh, palatal. The more palatal we go, the more deeper we go. The more buccal we go, the more higher we are coming. So the four millimeter is when we place the implant in uh, two millimeter in the palatal position. Uh, the one-time connect abutment we place also at the second stage surgery. Here you see two implants, two collars, which uh, are covered partially by, by bone. So basically just to show you the concept, uh, you see the, 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 the tissue height is approximately three millimeters and uh, one implant is at four, the, un the other one is at 3.5 below. So basically we are connecting two uh, connect abutments with one time, again, I repeat, one time, which are 1.5 millimeter in height. So again, we are transform transforming the bone level implant, which is a little bit subcrestal, into a tissue level implant, which is uh, with the connect abutment coming a little bit above the bone. Still, we have placed two millimeter to place to uh, to play with the uh, emergence profile of this tooth, and in this case, we use the cervical uh, system by VPI prefabricated emergence profile, and this is a clinical uh, view uh, on top of the uh, connect uh, abutment after the soft tissue maturation. Just a small video. and the final clinical outcome with the premolars. So 1.5 again millimeter of connect abutment placed one time at stage two. Uh, I would like to uh, also to show you uh, a case where we are uh, it's a more difficult case where we had the defect, a vertical defect. Actually, this is a nightmare in the implantology. 
and everybody can understand that these two implants are placed in the wrong position. Also, the other central incisor is not in a good situation. So you can see here that we are having uh, like a, 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 a root canal failure plus uh, some uh, uh, tooth substance uh, loss, which uh, makes uh, this tooth uh, having uh, um, a bad prognosis. So this is how the patient patient came to our office that it's a female patient uh, 37 years old healthy not smoking good oral hygiene uh, but the situation was really very very bad there uh, the numbers you uh, you see it's the probing depth so you see a healthy odontium practically and uh, our only problem i would say nightmare is the uh, bone loss and the soft tissue loss uh, at the uh, uh, first uh, quadrant, uh, of course, we couldn't probe there. Uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, radiograph and this is the clinical uh, image. It was really tricky to remove the prosthesis. As you can see here, it was uh, a part which was uh, cemented or uh, um, uh, connected and cemented on a uh, substrate which was uh, out of metal and pink porcelain, pink ceramics. So basically this was a very tough situation to take it out. It took me more than one hour. Uh, I couldn't communicate with the previous dentist. So basically this is what uh, came out. I managed to screw this out. And uh, <clears throat> Now next, of course, the tooth has a very bad prognosis. Now, uh, the next task is how we uh, develop, how we continue uh, surgically. Of course, the first thing to do is to remove the implants and the tooth. So practically have a vertical bone loss here. And as you can see, the implants were not in a good position and also in a good situation with the uh, bone loss around them. It's a nice system that we are uh, uh, applying um, <clears throat> uh, a reverse, a big reverse torque, uh, uh, and this is uh, how the implant uh, came out. So in this situation, we went uh, vertically uh, with a non-resorbable titanium reinforced membrane, and uh, horizontally on the tooth side where we used a resorbable uh, long-lasting uh, membrane. So it was, uh, and also we did uh, 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 50% autogenous bone harvest by, uh, from the Ramos and 50% uh, uh, xenograft. So this is the situation after six months. Uh, radiographically looked uh, good and also these are the um, <clears throat> uh, slices. Bone looks good now, uh, soft doesn't look good. So now, of course, every time we do a big GBR, as uh, you know, we are uh, pulling the soft tissue towards the palate in order to be able to uh, close uh, everything. So <clears throat> the height was good. Uh, what we did is, uh, of course, we, we need to open a flap because we need to remove the uh, non-resorbable titanium reinforced membrane and the pins. So of course, we are planning everything digital, and this is another trend now in implantology. Practically, we are planning everything digital. All of my cases uh, are uh, planned digitally, and we do in-house the, uh, the stents. Uh, practically, we do, this is the, uh, uh, the situation of the patient without teeth. We are doing also the uh, wax up, and uh, I'm not going to place three implants, but uh, I am asking to my lab to, uh, to, to prepare three places, potentially places for the implant placement. So this is the virtual implant placement. And uh, now this is another topic. Uh, if I give you this slice, I am sure that everybody of us will place the implant in a different position. So. Uh, there are different concepts. I will show you 
my concept. I spent five minutes with my designer to, to uh, measure the following things. First of all, we are measuring how deep should the implant be placed. The green line you see is the, my wax up, my central incisor perfect position in the mouth. So what I want to have there is at least four millimeters. And in this situation, we are 4.64 Y because the implant is placed more palatal. Remember, the more palatal we go, the more deeper we go. So it's very important things. Some things are very important because as you can see here, the, the second arrow and the third arrow, the third arrow is how deep, how uh, uh, much soft tissue we have over the bone. So in this situation, practically, if I remove the CT, uh, the slice, we have four millimeter, 4.5, we have a little bit more than two millimeter uh, palatal and we have two millimeter, three millimeter in the, uh, in the soft tissue height. So practically we place the implant a little bit subcrestal, but in order to place the implant subcrestal, uh, you have to have a conical connection, a very strong conical connection. No, and the implant should be rough to the top. So practically not every implant can be placed subcrestally. The numbers you see on the right side uh, is the ideal numbers. This implant is placed a little bit more than four millimeter sub, uh, below the clinical crown, a little bit more than two millimeter palatal to the clinical crown, and the soft tissue height in this case is 1.5 to two millimeters, so we place the implant subcrestal. So this is uh, the, guard, the guide stand that we are using, and this is the time of the uncovery. We see that uh, we have a very, a very good bone quality in this uh, case. So again, doing, uh, doing uh, um, uh, non-navigated procedure, for me, is very difficult. Even that I have placed a lot of implants, to place the implant in the exact correct position, it's really a, a difficult task. So you can see here uh, the M-guide system where we place the implant through the stent, as you can see here, very stable, very easy. And we place two implants, one in the lateral position and one in the central pos uh, inside position number 21. Also, uh, always when we do a GBR, a vertical GBR, there is a small part of, um, uh, of soft tissue on top of it, which we clean, we have to clean. And uh, that's why you see that we place the implant also uh, in uh, a little bit more subcrestal position because there's a part on top of it that we clean the soft tissue part. Of course, now comes the connective tissue graft. This is a very important uh, thing. And uh, uh, what I love with the connect abutment is that uh, uh, of course, we depithelize uh, the fridge interval graft that we took. Is that we can guide and connect the connective tissue graft to the connect abutment. So basically, I would say this is the CCC protocol. So, uh, what is the CCC protocol? Is connect connective tissue with connect abutment. So, practically, this is something that. Uh, we have to, to know that to place the, connect, the connective tissue where it's needed. So, and where it's needed, usually it's needed in the papilla area. So this is something that uh, also mm -hmm. I learned from Inaki Camborena that, uh, you know, he placed this, uh, 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 this uh, small abutment, thin abutment and the connective tissue uh, around it. So uh, uh, really this is something that we lot of times that we are connecting the connect abutment, sometimes I take higher connect abutments and I connect the connective tissue and there is no need for suturing it or uh, stabilizing this with another kind of uh, procedure. And everything is uh, sutured in place. And of course, we did have uh, an immediate stabil in initial stability, so we connected, uh, uh, we did an immediate loading procedure. And this is two weeks after the immediate loading procedure. Nice wound healing, as you can see in the palate. We always like to use when we're harvesting a connective tissue graft, this kind of template, which are 
is pushing the first 24 hours the donor sites and always we have this nice uh, healing so what you can see here that it's a small part of papillas are missing so uh, this is after three months and what we did subsequently this is a, a, a very nice surgery done by my friend uh, Ben Stankov from Bulgaria so practically uh, we take a, uh, he took a small connective tissue graft from the palate and placed it this is uh, number three uh, surgery and we uh, placed it in uh, between the papilla sites and this is two weeks and two months after surgery so now we are in the position and uh, what I really like is that uh, another trend and this is my final I would say message uh, to you is the digital workflow this is how it looks everything we decided uh, to go for uh, veneers we prepped uh, also from uh, from uh, can from premolar to premolar we prepped everything under microscope as you can see here and the whole case was performed was done with the digital uh, workflow and uh, this is something that uh, I really love now and uh, what we are doing is first of all we are uh, uh, we are <coughs> taking the impression of the, the pre-preparation scan after we remove we remove uh, the provisional and the cords and we are the soft tissue scan this has to be done immediately because we know where we have some shrink cuts either one 30 seconds after uh, provisional removal with some string cuts and uh, we do uh, we begin with a soft tissue scan after that it's very easy because we are positioning the uh, uh, scan analogs and we are taking the final scan of the implants so this is the situation this is how we are doing now uh, our cases and everything is overlapped here you can see the pre-preparation scan of the provisional, the soft tissue scan, very accurate. And here you see the gypsum model, uh, the virtual gypsum model. And very important is another thing that we are doing is we, the, we scan always the provisional extra orally because when we are dealing with the final restoration, uh, what we are uh, uh, see often is that the dental technician is giving us a little bit less volume to the final emergence profile. Why? Because they are trying to polish all the time. They are trying to polish and through polishing they are taking a small part of the ceramic of the zirconia out. So I always ask my dental technicians to over contour a little bit the part of the, um, uh, uh, of the transmucosal contour part of the zirconia. And here you can see our dental designer is overlapping the provisional you see this is the provisional and he is overlapping this in the in my impression in my digital impression so he can have exactly a copy of it so everything is done digitally i go a little bit faster and this is at the time of uh, delivery of that uh, case everything is uh, done monolithic so this is the three unit bridge made out of zirconia and these are the connect abutments We already cemented the veneers from premolar to premolar, and this is the final 
a radiographic outcome. And this is the final clinical image of the uh, work, which was done um, uh, monolithic and uh, uh, totally, completely uh, digital. And with this submit, I would like to come uh, slowly to the end of my uh, presentation. And uh, as a take-home message, I would say that, um, first of all, conical connection and platform switching are important factors for implant in the aesthetic zone. Uh, the accurate 3D positioning and guided placement is crucial for success. We have to have a systematic uh, uh, protocol. Uh, the bone, which should be at least two millimeter and uh, um, around the implants and the soft tissue, which should be at least three millimeters, are both needed around implants. Zirgonia and titanium are the material of choice in the transmucosal contour, as I told you. Last but not least, and this is coming first, uh, hybrid implant designs might be beneficial on the long-term aesthetic outcome we don't know yet, we, sh we should wait for some years, but my feeling is that these kind of implants are really beneficial for the long-term outcome. The transmucosal part of the zirgonia abutment should be always hand polished, uh, not placed. The titanium interfaces in cases we are not using the one-time abutment should be at least two millimeter in height. It seems that the uh, uh, one-time abutment, the connect abutment, might be beneficial for soft and hard tissue stability. Um, if used one time, this is something that uh, uh, clinically, the, all the years that I'm using this concept, I see really good results, and we are preparing now publication about it on, 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 on that topic. And I think for me, the future uh, in abutment designing is the digital incorporation of the DICOM uh, uh, scan in the STL files of the working models because uh, the dental technician, the designer, uh, has to see in, when he designs the abutment uh, the bone as well. Because uh, as until now, when they design, they see only the soft tissue. So for me, um, it's very important when they design an abutment, they should have also the bone uh, into the designing process. And uh, I, as, as, uh, to finish, I would uh, love to share, this was one of my last trips before the COVID times in Barcelona, when I saw uh, this one, uh, uh, this saying from uh, Antoine Gaudi, to do things right, first you need love and then technique. So this is uh, the end of my presentation. And I would like to thank you for your kind attention. And this is my email uh, for those you want to uh, write me or ask anything. I am always available. Sometimes I don't answer the same day, but uh, uh, I sure <clears throat> answer the next days. So I'm going to answer to you in case you need something. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And so much. Omid. Stafford, thank you let so me much, my friends. Open. Oh. Again, and again, beautiful presentation by you. I couldn't expect anything less than that because it was amazing as always. And before I start the discussion part, for all our audience, I'm pretty sure they're familiar with you because you're almost everywhere lecturing the biggest podiums and so many people learn from you. But I truly recommend you all if you're interested in these beautiful works, you should follow Stavros' page on Instagram because he posts so many beautiful stuff there and so many great lives sometimes. So you can learn more and more from this great friend because he's one of the true educators from the very, very years ago. And he continues to be the best all the time and always on the top of the updated technology. So my friend, um, I really, actually, it was also a very great review for me, and also, I learned a lot also from this presentation. But um, I have some questions and comments regarding that. And one of the things that I'm pretty sure you are among the best that I can ask, because you are truly expert in the prosthodontics field, 
comparing connect apartments and target apartments, do you find any differences regarding the results that we're going to gain? Or uh, if both of them be done correctly, we can achieve the same results, especially regarding the bonus stability. Can you, can you repeat the question because it was uh, an, yeah. uh, an interruption in the noise? Yeah, regarding uh, connect abutments and tie base abutments, I want to know, do you find any differences regarding the outcome in uh, uh, bonus stability or soft tissue stability? Or yeah. if we work with both of them, the results are going to be the same. So uh, basically, we started with this uh, uh, kind of uh, procedure already uh, uh, more than eight years ago. It was not a connect abutment. It was another kind of abutment. And uh, clinically, what I can see is that uh, when I try to probe around this abutment, I see what my feeling is that I have a dense connective tissue around it. So practically, uh, my probe does not go through. When, uh, <clears throat> when we are probing around uh, teeth, we know that uh, uh, the uh, attachments of the hemidesmosomes are very weak. So basically, what, what stops us from going deep to the bone is the connective tissue. So my feeling was that uh, we have a dense connective tissue orientation, not connection. I wouldn't say connection because the word connection is, uh, is uh, not correct. But uh, uh, I would say an integration of fibers, of dense connective tissue fibers around these abutments. So this is my clinical evaluation, my clinical feeling. Uh, and, and I see that with the connect, of course, uh, as well. Um, Going into numbers, uh, I think it's not published yet, but um, uh, Thomas Linkevicius did already a study comparing um, the tie base and the um, uh, connect abutment, one time connect abutment. Uh, uh, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure, I think uh, I had a personal communication with him. I think uh, the numbers uh, of uh, bone remodeling are um, slightly better the connect button. So again, if this is statistically important, uh, I don't know, maybe it's not, but clinically uh, we have better number, but uh, talking about numbers, we have less bone resorption, maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3 or 0 0.1, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, clinically might be not important, but as I said in the beginning of my lecture, these are small things, yeah. small stones in the puzzle. And when we combine them, all of them, that might, that might have, this might have a big, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, on, the, on the final outcome. So I think uh, this uh, uh, publication will, will come uh, soon, uh, but uh, this was my first communication I had with him. Uh, and. Uh, co uh, and my clinical feeling is always that the connect abutment is much better as the, as the team base than the team base. Yeah. And, and you were talking about the, the placement of the platform of the implant and the choosing of the proper connect abutment height for the one abutment one time concept. Um, if I'm getting right, because my my philosophy usually is that because i want to have enough soft tissue thickness so i prefer to place the platform of the implant four millimeters below the future margin of the crown so better say that placement of the implant from the soft tissue margin not from the bone so with that said do you usually prefer to place your implant about a millimeters below the crest of the bone or sometimes, depend on the soft tissue thickness, you prefer to go even deeper and place a longer connective abutment. And so I, my question is like this. Do you prefer to go deeper in the bone if necessary, or you prefer to do the soft tissue augmentation to increase the tissue height? Is 
very good questions to me. Uh, uh, let's let's start prosthetically speaking, because as you know, I do the prosthetics. So for me, in order to have a good emergence profile, uh -huh. uh, you need the four millimeter, 3.5 to four millimeters. So basically for me, there is no question that I place the implant four millimeter deeper than my clinical crown. Yeah. So the margin of the soft tissue margin of my clinical crown. But we all know uh, we are we are <clears throat> we are not uh, living in uh, the ideal world. So sometimes we need to place an implant a little bit subcrestal, or we need to place any or where we have. <clears throat> Uh, or we have sometimes more soft tissue than we need, also sometimes in posterior area or in, even in premolar area. So that's why I love the versatility of the connect abutment because I can change, I can, I can play with it. So it's not that uh, always we are at 3.5 or 4 millimeter deeper. Sometimes we are 4.5, sometimes we are 5. Sometimes we are 3.5, and then I choose the corresponding um, connect abutment height. Sometimes I go 1.5 connect or 2 or 2.5, sometimes 3. So this is what I love. Your second part of the question was uh, uh, tricky, uh, and I, I, I like it. Uh, I prefer to... Um, <clears throat> Uh, to, to augment soft tissue, if I can. But sometimes we know that uh, we have uh, difficult patients, smokers, for example. I hate to do augmentations in smokers. So uh, there are situations where I, I, I place my implant deeper in order to gain some soft tissue. But you have to have a good implant system. This is the prerequisite. We have to have a very strong conical connection. And uh, when I do this, immediately I place the connect abutment. I transform the deep, conic the, the, implant, the deep implant placement into a soft tissue uh, placement. This is uh, what uh, uh, I love in the one-time connect abutment. Yeah, yeah, got the point. So, so if you are, if you're speaking in the aesthetic zone, so I think as I, as I got you right, most of the time, if not a specific situation, you prefer to do the soft tissue graft, not really place your implant very deep, maximum like two millimeters deeper than the crest, yes. right? Exactly. And I, I, I agree. I mean, maxim, maximum is 1.5 to two millimeters. Yeah. And these, these uh, connect abutments are available in different heights, as I know, right? And, but just one thing that I wanted to ask you. Exactly. I want to know if all companies have uh, connect abutments or no. Uh, the first uh, case, the first cases we did more than 10 years ago, it was uh, uh, with... Uh, uh, external connection, two-piece intermediate abutment. The, the, the case that I showed you uh, was an example. Uh, when you have a two-piece, which means that we have like a multi-unic and a second screw going inside, uh, this is something that we don't like because we know that uh, bacteria penetration can occur. So the next uh, step was to, to make uh, an abutment one-piece, so basically we place the implant and we place the abutment final torque it and we don't remove it anymore pra practically we are sealing the implant and uh, <clears throat> uh, the next step was to make it internal connection mm -hmm. uh, so as i'm aware now i think there are three to four implant companies right now that they are going into uh, this direction um, uh, I, 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 I think 3i was the one that started. I don't uh, have anything with names. Uh, then uh, <clears throat> MIS, the one on one abutment from Nobel Biocare, for example, is another example. And uh, now 
I know Anthogear is another implant company that uh, has also this kind of concept. I, I think now the companies will move towards to the direction because this is really a nice company, a, a nice concept to have um, a concept like this. Yeah, great, great. Um, Stavros, I, I noticed that you are among the people that have started to do the socket shield and you presented a beautiful case because I'm also a great fan of it. So I noticed that in the case you presented by, uh, I think it was a central incisor and you did a beautiful treatment and the beautiful stable results that you showed, uh, the apex of the shield of the, of the tooth was there and with, uh, with a lower amount of gotcha perica at the end. So I want to know your experience on that because uh, it's not a rule about it, but so many people prefer to remove the apex. And, uh, but, but sometimes we are placing the implant, it's for example, in this direction, but the root is, is completely to the buckle. So there is no uh, cross between them. I want to know your idea about it because you have a lot of follow-up that you prefer to remove the apex all the time or did you find no difference or any difference uh, if their apex remains there? You have a good eye on mid, uh, that's right. I think uh, that uh, I was uh, lucky in this case, mm -hmm. to tell you the truth. It was a case that we did uh, eight, nine years ago. We didn't have the, uh, the right instruments, or I, I would say there was no protocol, exact protocol, how we should do this. And uh, now I am, uh, uh, really happy that they are people that they develop this technique. I mean, uh, of course, uh, uh, Mark was the one, Mark Ritzler was the one, the one that introduced this technique to me. But uh, <clears throat> uh, I know there is, um, there are people that uh, develop this technique and they develop like uh, 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 my friend from South Africa. Um, <laughs> How we got uh, now? I, Howard Glackman, yes, uh, my, my good friend Howard Glackman, who um, really developed a good uh, protocol in, uh, in how to remove and how to do the, 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 the shield. Uh, and all this uh, group with Maurice Salama. Uh, I totally agree that we have to remove the apex. So basically, First, we remove the half of the tooth, tooth and the apex, and then we are going to place the implant because we are never sure uh, what happens with the endo. I mean, we, if we have a clean root or not. So uh, right now, I am removing uh, the apex of the tooth. Uh, the case which I showed you uh, was one of the first case, but I, got, I was lucky in this case. Yeah, yeah, good point. You know. You, you show truly, truly very beautiful cases. So I think it was full of, full of learning for all of us, at least for me, it was amazing. And I just wanted to end this discussion with uh, my final question. Actually, it's, it's not a, like a question because if you want to talk about it, I think you can talk about it for days. But uh, I think it's one of the things that maybe so many people interested in shaping the tissue really looking for. And that's uh, the way that you, sh you make your provisionals. Because in your cases, as I noticed, in most of the cases, you, you beautifully shaped the papilla and everything was stable, the color, we didn't see any scar, any line, anything. So it was all perfect. So I wanna know um, if you're talking about digital dentistry, for example, you can, you can scan it and you you shape it the way that you want it and you ins you screwed it to the implant and let the tissue heal but sometimes practitioners add layer by layer to form the tissue because we nowadays in many countries not all the dentists have the digital approach and have that facility so i want to know if you want to recommend them uh, as easy approach First of all, if they want to go digital, can they place the exact final shape that they want in the area to put pressure on the tissue to be formed? Or you don't recommend any pressure and you prefer to go layer by layer? 
I want to know your recommendation on that. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, actually, <clears throat> regarding the scars, uh, I, whenever I do a flap in the aesthetic zone, I am trying to, <clears throat> to have the, the, the releasing incision away from the aesthetic zone. This is uh, uh, part uh, number one. Uh, uh, when I need uh, incision in the aesthetic zone, I always go in the frenulum, so it's hidden. Uh, <clears throat> The question about the, um, the prosthesis and the emergence profile, uh, this uh, whole protocol starts from the provisional phase. Uh, in cases where I have tooth extraction, and it's either it is an incisor or a premolar or a, a molar, and I have the full contour there, what I'm doing is immediately preserve preserve the contour with the provisional. So full contour provisional mm -hmm. or full contour healing abutment, mm -hmm. customized, not, not round one. Yeah. It should be customized. So I always uh, have a full contour provisional or customized abutment. Mm -hmm. So even if I put a connective tissue graft, I try to preserve. So I don't change my... I, I take what I have. In cases where I, um, uh, I need to close or I, uh, I go flapless, I don't like to go flapless, but uh, when I need to close and I do the implant uncovery, then I don't like to go full contour because this is something I cannot control. Then I go slim. I go like thin, uh, maybe like uh, four millimeter going up like a mushroom and at the same time I am putting if I need connective tissue graft around my abutments or about my provisional. Uh, then I need in the second stage to add composite, to add some material in order to form the emergence profile. Uh, usually it takes me uh, two appointments. The, uh, the first appointment is I'm adding let's say uh, a part of uh, approximately one millimeter, 1.5 millimeter to go to go to, to the full contour. And the second appointment is always 10 days later when I'm going full contour. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is when I have the tooth, I preserve the contour. If I don't have the, the tooth, I go in two appointments in the full contour. Yeah. So basically, and then this I am keeping, it doesn't have to do, I can go digitally or I can go analogically, but the, the concept is the same. Yeah, yeah, I got the point. Because I think, I think it's one of the parts that everybody should, should keep in mind that I think it's one of the critical timing and critical steps that make the aesthetic results predictable and beautiful. Savers, I have to thank you again so much for your time for your patience and for your beautiful presentation as always. It was my pleasure to host you and thank you so much for your time and really looking forward to see you very, very soon somewhere in the world. Thank you so much, Sumit. It was my honor to be with you. Uh, and uh, uh, really, I, I, I like your work and uh, I am really looking forward to meet you in person. Thank you so much, my friend. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.